thank you so much for joining me today. It's such a delight uh, to, to join virtually like this, and I'm really <laughs> excited that we're going to be working together to do a program um, from, you know, all our places virtually to everybody in Quincy and, and, and beyond who want to tune in. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Um, we were just talking uh, before we started recording about what a vital role the Quincy Historical Society is playing in the community right now. Uh, and so I want to make sure everybody knows that you and Ed are, are working away and that these are, you know, historical times we're living through and both working with us to help, you know, talk about what impact and how do we remember these times in the future and what lessons can we learn from our history that we can apply to, to life today. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, this is a really topical program that right. you're going to be talking about where you have done a lot of research and, and the Historical Society has done a lot of research into the effect of the last major pandemic that affected Quincy, which would be the pandemic that happened in 1918. That is correct, yeah. Were um, you, was that research done before you joined the Historical Society? or Nope, that was, um, I was one of the co-leads on that particular project. Um, it was a joint effort, really, between Ed and myself. Mm -hmm. um, he focused more on the biographical research, so actually finding out information about victims and as many of the individuals as that we could um, identify, and then I was more about researching the timeline, so going through the newspapers and such and kind of figuring out exactly, piecing together what the story actually was in Quincy. Wow. So, so walk me through a little bit. I mean, this is obviously the subject of the program, but I just, mm -hmm. as a little teaser for folks. Sure. So you collected, how did you go about this? What, what was, uh, in, in like a quick nutshell that we'll obviously expand on later. Right. Um, so, at, you know, it's sort of the five second spiel or a little bit longer um, yeah. is that, you know, this project started when we were actually working on an unrelated um, uh, research project. It was while we were doing research for one of our publications, the Quincy Book of Days, mm -hmm. um, which was a publication that came out the same year. Um, we hosted a program for that when it came out. did, yes, library. absolutely. <laughs> um, and one of the entries in that, I think in October, is a from, from a headline from the Patriot Ledger about how um, Quincy was allegedly the one of the, the most severe um, cases or had some of the most severe cases in Massachusetts or the most severely hit in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is a very alarming headline to read. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So we decided to follow up on that, check if that's actually, or if that was actually true and, and kind of try and figure out if there was anything worth looking into there. And as it turns out, it absolutely was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we weren't really able to determine whether or not Quincy w was the worst affected in Massachusetts, but we were certainly able to determine that there was a very unique story to what actually happened in Quincy during that pandemic. Um, uh, the crux of it is that the city at one point was so overwhelmed and just was not sure what to do about this, uh, that they actually handed over control of the pandemic and, and of the entire city essentially uh, to the Navy. Um, wow. with a vested interest in Quincy at that point because of the shipyard and because it's 1918. It, we're right in the middle of America's involvement in World War One, And so, of course, the Navy wants to protect, you know, their um, uh, industrial um, interests, but also, you know, want to, and want to, wants to keep that strong. So protect they, their labor force, I'm sure. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, which they had a very large one at that time. Yeah. So they stepped in and actually took over management of the pandemic in Quincy. And that meant running the city essentially for a matter of a few weeks. Wow. What a fascinating story. Yeah. And that, and that, as far as we can tell, that did not happen anywhere else in the United States. Or at least we haven't been able to find um, any other cases uh, like that. Now, I know that when you presented this story before, there was a little concern because we're actually talking about real people who lived in yes. Quincy. We have names. You've developed a map that shows where these people, we, we believe, died. Um, mm -hmm. And we have names attached to these locations. Yep. Um, but as we were talking about this before, uh, there's not, I mean, this all happened over 100 years ago. Um, yes. But tell me a little bit about that and let's help make sure that people are comfortable that we're not um, sharing family secrets. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. So um, one of the big um, pieces of the project that uh, when we were doing the research that we decided that we wanted to do was create um, a spot map, an epidemiological spot map of all of the victims that we could identify. Um, granted, we were 
for the technical um, aspects, we were focusing just on the peak of the pandemic. So there's three phases of the pandemic, three waves essentially. And the second wave is the one that we focused on because that was the most, um, struggling for the word there, uh, that was- the, the, the most impactful or the most- Yes, that, that was- assent- yeah. Yes, that was that was the most impactful. That was um, certainly the worst part of the pandemic, um, at least as far as Quincy was concerned. Um, so we focused on that one in terms of the scope of our project. And so in making this map, we, ident- we used a combination of um, city directories, um, old city records, um, as well as death certificates to be able to identify as many of the victims as we possibly could. Um, because in the official counts that we saw, they it was actually underrepresented. Um, at first, um, influenza was not actually even a reportable disease. So Quincy was like nobody in Massachusetts at all, but and also in Quincy, was even reporting how many cases there were at all. Um, everybody just died of consumption once upon a time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thereabouts, yes. But, but it, as um, because of this, you know, you have um, records of individuals dying of things that are not influenza. It's either pneumonia or, or something along those lines that happened to be a byproduct of the influenza. So we had to go through and tease all that out. But in that process, we made that spot map and we were actually able to trace the spread through Quincy and see the areas that were more heavily affected. Um, we did have a little bit of confusion (laughs) after the rollout of that, um, of that map in which people were a little bit shocked at like, oh no, it, are you sharing people's personal information? And it's these, unfortunately, these are people who died a hundred years ago, but there is certainly no um, uh, current information about, personal information about anybody currently living. I suspect most of the people that knew these people personally are also dead since it's been- For the most long. part, we would assume so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but people may see some family members in this uh, yes. because this definitely was our community. We have actually had members um, of the Historical Society looking at it and messaging us and saying, this is so interesting. I I found out about a family member I didn't know I had because no one in my family ever mentioned them before um, who died during the pandemic. Um, And so there's been some some really interesting stories about, you know, discovery within one's family tree uh, because of this. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a very fascinating story and I'm so glad that you've done this research uh, and, and are able to share it with us. I, I, I know this is a program that some people may have caught before, as, as we were just alluding to, um, but it's going to be in a new fashion. So probably even the people who saw it before, we're all seeing things with a different light as we're living through a different pandemic today. Absolutely. So. Yeah, no, it's I mean, one of our focuses um, when we were doing this the first time, this was in January of uh, 2019, uh, was thinking about how crazy was this? This was just, I could never imagine living in a world where, you know, theaters and, and schools are shut down and you can't, and you're kind of under quarantine and, well, here we are. <laughs> yes, we never thought we were going to live through this. It always felt so long ago. And so in some ways, I think we can take heart that we have lived through some pretty horrific pandemics before. As, as yes, we no, this about. is... Something that has actually been rather comforting to me is to think that, you know, as a society, we have gotten through these types of um, events before. Um, Very sadly, there, you know, there is a tragic loss of life, but we, you know, as a community, we pull together and and we make it through. And that's what we're going to do now as well. But thank you so much for joining me, Alexandra. I'm really looking forward to this program. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to it, too.